Welcome, everyone, to Seek, Go, Create. This is your host, Tim Winders. This is where we redefine success in leadership, business, and in ministry. Today, we're going to have heavy conversation on leadership and business. One thing I want to get to before we get to our guest, though, just a reminder to you, your host, Tim Winders, has written his first novel, it is probably when you're listening in going to be available it's going to be released in late may depending on when you're listening in but you can get all the information at seekgocreate.com forward slash book if you go there before the release you can get some information find out about the pre-release and everything that's going on afterwards you can get the details there it is a novel but it is a novel with purpose, with mission. It's a story about redefining success. So make sure you go and get a copy of that. Got some authors with us today, and I just finished reading their book. Excited to have Octavian Pantius as he's an entrepreneur. He's with us. He's the co-founder and managing partner of Qualians, an international training and consulting company. And I've got some tough pronunciations today. I've got Emil Dobrovolsky. He's a pilot, pilot instructor and a pilot examiner. If you're watching in, he's the guy in the uniform. And uh, he started at Tarum, Romanian Air Transport in 1994. And he's done all types of things in the, uh, in the world of air travel, piloting. I've got a long list of things here. Just Let's just say he knows his stuff. So gentlemen, welcome to Seek, Go, Create. Thank you, Tim, for having us on the show. It's a pleasure to be here, and hello to everybody who's watching or listening. Yeah, now you guys have written you guys have written a book, and we're going to talk leadership and all in just a moment. But I want to get my first question out of the way. It's kind of my icebreaker. It's what I do when I'm out and about. If I bump into you, Octavian, and we're just chit chatting, either we're on a plane or something like that, and I just ask the question: What do you do? What do you typically tell people? Well, I would say if we met on the plane, I would say something like uh, professionally, I have three hats. One is the one of entrepreneur. I've been in the training and consulting uh, industry since 1999, so for 20 plus years now. Uh, and we work with international companies across areas to help them grow their leaders and to help them grow their uh, their culture and develop their skills. Second hat is I'm an author. I started writing audiobooks in 2008. Uh, on managing time, on communication, on change. Uh, and I wrote a uh, time management and work-life balance book back in uh, 2012, which is still very uh, valid today. And uh, of course, the book I co-authored with Captain Emil Dobrovolsky, Dark Cockpit, which is this one, just in case people are uh, watching it. Uh, and my third hat is I'm a, a speaker. I'm invited often to speak to companies, to audiences, large and small, on subjects like change, attitude change, leadership, and also work-life balance, and uh, and more frequently now, the future of work, the great resignation, the whatever uh, name we want to give it. So this is kind of a short uh, intro. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, I love all of those because those are some valuable resources in our culture and society today. And you're speaking my language. Now, Emil, I'm going to go to you and let's pretend that we're somewhere that you're not in your uniform and we bump into each other. And I say, oh, you know, we're at a children's thing or something like that. I don't know where we are out at a restaurant. And I ask you the question, what do you do? What do you typically tell people? I always thought about myself as a professional. Uh, as a child, I always dreamed about being a pilot or an astronaut, but um, I was lucky enough to become one, to become a pilot. But um, if I will not be a pilot, I'll be a professional in other, in other professions. I don't know. I always respected uh, and I respect uh, professionals. They are working maybe with their hands, but they are doing great things. I, I learned to respect people around me that they are providing things to me, uh, like uh, I don't know, like a plumber, like an electrician. I always respect the professional when I see one loving his job, doing the best to improve himself or herself, to become better, to provide for their clients. So I'm a professional in, in short. Yeah, and, and it's interesting you use the word professional. I think I just finished reading the section of the book towards the end where the both of you discuss 
what a professional is and uh, and, and some of those things were, were powerful. We may get to those at some point during our conversation. I want to ask each of you, though, before we get too much farther, right before we hit record, I kind of asked what part of the world you're in, and both of you are in Romania, which is a company has been a country that has been some time since I visited back in the mid to late 90s. Our son has recently visited there on some missions trips and done some work there in the last few years, but this was pre-pandemic. Uh, one of the questions I like to ask while we're in the midst of all that we are in the world, how's everything going there? You know, hopefully everybody's moving away from pandemic, but just one of you give me a status so that people in the other parts of the world know what's going on currently in Romania and specifically Bucharest, where you gentlemen are. I don't know, Octavian, can you do that? Sure, sure. So geographically, we're Eastern Europe, right? A little east from Hungary. Some people say, um, uh, oh, Romania, ah, that's Budapest. No, that's that's Hungary. That's uh, 100 uh, or 500 miles uh, west from Bucharest. Bucharest is a very nice city, and we invite everyone to travel. In two hours traveling east by car, you're at the seaside. Two hours north, you're skiing in the mountains. And of course, you have Bucharest, which is... Uh, and, and, and two hours northwest is Dracula's castle or whatever uh, that uh, story goes if people want to visit. Um, it's good. We're part of the European Union. Economy is doing well. Pandemic is slowing down a little bit. Uh, economy is going well. Um, um, the, there's a, I wouldn't say war for talent, but um, uh, the recent graduates, most of them can easily find a good job if they speak foreign languages and are good in IT. And we have got a lot of companies investing in this uh, in this area. So it's a good it's a land of opportunity for for people. And by the way, recently uh, the government launched the uh, dig digital nomad uh, term, which uh, because it's pandemic, you can work from everywhere. So it's easy to get a visa and to get a work permit and things like that. So be sure to put it on your uh, uh, list whenever you want to travel somewhere. Yeah, I highly recommend people visit Romania at some point. I, the, the people when I was there years ago, so beautiful, such good hearts, uh, compassionate. Yep. I mean, there are people all over that are that way, but I, I just, I found that to be the case. And wasn't it, is Bucharest the Paris of the East there? So It used to be called, it? yeah, it used to be called the Paris of the East uh, between the two wars. Yeah, it was a very nice place to be. It still is a very nice place to be. Now lots of investments and many people are uh, who owned nice houses in the downtowns of the city. They're renovating now, there are funds for that, so you can redo the old towns uh, to really look good. Yeah. Yeah, very good. So, Emil, I want to jump over to you because a, a lot of our conversation today is going to be related. It's going to be, it's going to have the theme of, of piloting, airplane, aeronautical, uh, all of those things. But I, I think what I'd love to do first is just find out, you mentioned being a professional earlier, but I would love to know how you ended up in uh, the position and role you're in of being a pilot, because I, I think personalities, I think backgrounds, things like that, feed a lot into what we end up becoming. And you, you used a lot of words earlier, professional, and you know we could see the uniform and things like that. But how did Emil become a pilot? I mean, is that something you wanted to do from like earliest recollections, or did you just stumble into it? Yeah, indeed, I had uh, I had this dream of becoming a pilot since I was a child. And uh, I always uh, was I was always fascinated about the aircraft, about uh, how they fly, about uh, men doing amazing things. You know, brave men doing things like I don't know, taking the, a piece of machinery and flying across the oceans or across the, the sea. And uh, uh, this 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 dream became reality for me. But with hard work, I'm not the one. I'm I'm not one of those. They are gifted to be, or no? We have a word saying that the flight is for birds. So I completely resonate with that because I didn't, I don't know how to fly as a, as a human being. So I learn little by little, day by day, in I don't know, repeating the same exercises, learning a lot, reading a lot. So this kind of uh, effort um, eventually uh, pay off, paid off for me. So I became a pilot. I was lucky enough to fly for the Romanian national uh, uh, carrier. I have now a license of uh, European uh, Aviation Agency, Safety Agency, and I'm a senior examiner now. So this effort along the years paid off for me. Um, 
of course, when I look back, I, I never realized how, how much work was into it. So when I was a young, young, uh, I don't know, student at the military academy, uh, dreaming about becoming a pilot, those now what I'm looking at when I looked up a few people like me now I, I remember when I looked at them I I, I almost uh, uh, glorified them I thought wow they are super humans uh, look at them and then uh, little by little I become one of them and I realize it's normal when you when you put some effort when you are, have uh, when you train your skills when you improve your knowledge every time every time you you fly every time you go somewhere so uh, hear, hear me now, professional pilot talking to you, and I'm co-author of this book. The book, actually, I wanted to correct you because the book was not written for the pilots. And what we talk about, uh -huh. our speeches are not for, yeah, maybe they can learn something. Uh, my, my, my co-workers, my pilots, my, my airmen. But uh, the book is addressed to you, to generic pilots, to people that are piloting their, their, their businesses, their lives, their families. So for the, the book is um, especially for this, for you, for the generic pilots. Yeah, if I misspoke on that, my apologies, because I do agree. I think y'all have taken the, uh, the terminology, the mindset, the structure, the systems, and you've made it available for, we'll call it the layman, the average guy, the average Joe there. Um, one more thing, Emil, though, this is something that's, that was intriguing me as I was reading this, and I may have Octavian chime in on this as someone who's known you, is I, I grew up in the Atlanta uh, area of the United States, and we were in a, a small town that was a suburb that had a large number of Delta employees, the airlines Delta. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. And, and when I was growing up, the the people that seemed to be at the top end of the income spectrum were the Delta pilots, the captains. And uh, and it was it was always a little bit of this. Uh, it wasn't making fun or anything, but it's kind of like, OK, those guys fly a few days a month. They don't work the rest of the time and they make a lot of money. And uh, but but I think the airline industry has changed tremendously since this was the early 70s. Uh, Emil, can you share a little bit on just, we talk business here, so this is a good business conversation too, just just the stresses and strains of the industry that you are in. And then I'm going to ask a little bit about personality, and this is where I want Octavian to chime in, because I, I, I notice there's a certain personality with people that are in that role too, but just talk about the industry for just a moment, if you would. Um, to be honest, when I wanted to become a pilot, I never thought about money for me it was <laughs> yeah the money are good maybe they're above average but uh, uh, there was a joke you know about the three things the pilots should have the the days off the neighbors see they have <laughs> yeah uh, they'll be brilliant for pilots um, the <laughs> the money the the neighbor the relative things they have and the third one, I will tell you privately, but this is a joke. <laughs> the people, they see us from outside, you know, but it's actually, it's not a free, it's not a, a job for somebody who wants to be free because we are not free at all. We're always following the procedures. We are flying in a very regulated airspace. We are following the SOPs from A to Z every day, every time, hundreds of time of day. So it's not a, a matter of being free like a bird and you fly across the sky. It's a matter of uh, being safe, first of all. Uh, uh, it's a contract. My, my job is to, to bring people from, to fly people from A to B in a safely, on time and comfortable manner. So this is the, the simple, let's say, contract I have with my employer. And I, I do this on my best. I'm going, to, I'm going to the checks every time. Right now I'm doing the ground freshing course and the next month I'm going, I'm going for my check. I'm a, I'm a senior examiner, but every six months I have to go through the training sessions to the checking sessions in order to be uh, competent to fly. So at the end I have, I have to prove my proficiency every six months and the same is for every, every pilot around me, every professional pilot. Right, Let me absolutely. just um, 
Um, yeah, thank you. I just add one one figure about how the industry is doing. A figure that summarizes nicely how it's doing. Before the pandemic, at almost any given moment uh, of time, there would be about twenty five thousand pl commercial planes in the sky at a given moment. Uh, then pandemic hit, and the number went down to eight thousand, eight seven, eight thousand. So it was a huge drop from twenty five thousand to eight thousand. Last week. The peak of the post pandemic or during pandemic was hit, which was 15,000. So it's better than two years ago, almost two years ago, or more or less March, spring of 2020, but it's not yet at the level uh, where it could be. There's still planes on the ground and things. Like that. It's not as sad. Emil used to tell me stories when we, he was flying in the spring of 2020 that uh, he would fly into Heathrow, for instance, a usually super crowded in London uh, airport. Now, most uh, lines were occupied by planes being parked there. Now it's movement a lot. I'm sure people are flying, the ones who are listening, but it's not yet uh, at the level where it was. So 15 to 25, still a long way to go. Yeah. Right, absolutely. In uh, no, uh, June, June 2019, it was the record of all times. In one day, in June 2019, there were 250,000 flights that day. So that dropped to a few thousand in the yeah. next and now we are picking up again yeah mm. all right octavian i've got a question for you you have you obviously have known emil for a little while and and y'all at some point decided to partner up and write a book together what what is your um and i'm actually trying to ask some questions for the listener that may not understand sure. the jargon of the pilot but they might be in a leadership role or ownership role what what has your um outsider looking in uh, uh, perception of that role of the pilot, because it, it's kind of one of these roles that I do think at times we put way up on a pedestal. And I think that's a good thing. They really do have the safety and all of a, a lot of people in their hands. But uh, what are your thoughts? What, what, what was your sure. observations of the pilot? Uh, yeah, uh, let me talk specifically about Emil right after I give the context a little bit, which would be useful to our yeah. listeners who are entrepreneurs or who are in the... So in every cockpit, there are two pilots, right? There's the co-pilot uh, on the right seat, and then there's the captain, the commander of the flight on the seat on the left. Both of them are good. The pilot obviously is better, is more experienced, has uh, significantly more flight hours. So that's one differentiator between the uh, one who sits on the right and the one who sits. But there are two more differentiators, which are even more important than the, the first one, because almost any pilot, if they fly enough, if they're, dif if they're disciplined, they'll get the flight hours, they'll get the experience, they will go through enough storms and crosswind landings and stuff, they'll be able to handle that. But, uh, and this is, um, uh, every airline, when they examine pilots and decide who will get to become a commander, they look at these two things. Number one is maturity in making decisions and in behavior. So piloting a flight is not like uh, you just bought a new sports car and I go into an empty parking lot and I show my friends what I can do with it and I go around. It's really not about that. It's not about um, uh, boasting your skills. It's not about, oh, I can land through this storm and all the recommendations say go to another airport. That's not the moment to say, no, I think I can do this. I saw movies with Denzel Washington and with the uh, all the other captain. I can, I, no, it's maturity means you understand what's going on and you make the best decision. You don't haste into decisions. And here's um, here's one aviation quote that I'd like to include, which is relevant to everybody who leads a team that says superior uh, pilots will use their superior experience to prevent a situation where they have to use their superior skills. So it's not that the superior pilots don't have superior skills and are able to maneuver the plane in which in ways in which you can't imagine, no is that they have the maturity, the experience to know how to prevent those situations. So it's this maturity that people are looking for when they think about, surely we have got that pilot who says, I want to be a commander registered for their exam. That's one thing they look at. Another thing they look at is responsibility. 
Uh, and this is um, some people, some pilots, really, uh, they're, they're good. Let's say they have the maturity, to make the, but they don't want this responsibility. We have a chapter in the book that's called 61 Signatures, because I know as Emil was sharing stories with me about aviation, he says, I, he, one of the things he said, I, I, I sign documents, I don't know how many times a day. And I say, um, just for fun, could you count how many times you sign per day? And if he has a busy day with flights from A and B and then B to E and something, the, the number of signatures is can go up to 61. So that means that he takes on responsibility for the plane, uh, for the technical side. The uh, guy on the technical side here, the plane is fine, sign for it. I sign for it, it's mine now. Just to, just to make a parallel, some people when they rent a car, a $10,000 car, the guy at the desk, would you like insurance? And the guy, oh, of course I like insurance. I mean, they don't want to take responsibility for a $10,000 car. How about a $200 million plane and something infinitely more valuable, 200 souls on board or 150 or 400. So it's this responsibility that you know you've signed for it, you're responsible, you decide what the destination should be. We cannot land at point B for weather or safety procedures. We do that. So. Um, some pilots who are on the right hand side or the co-pilots they don't move to the left seat uh, either because they don't yet have the maturity or because they they simply they say hey, you be the one who takes that now um so this these are three items more experience um maturity in making decisions and um, and responsibility these are critical criteria that as business leaders we should look at when we think about promoting someone right uh, yeah, he's the best sales guy in the world. Okay, does he have the maturity not to give away discounts uh, the moment the customer asks for them, for instance? Does he or she, uh, or is he or she willing to uh, take responsibility for the overall target for the team of three or four or five? Uh, for instance, somebody who's listening might, might say, hey, I was missed on a promotion once where I worked somewhere before. I don't know why, because that was good. Yeah, maybe maybe they did not see the other two things. Now, I'm sure nobody in our audience was ever missed for a promotion because they're good, but some other people who are not listening to the show, maybe they were for this week. Now, you see these um, at a meal every single time we meet, and we saw this in the one and a half years that it took us to, to write the book. He was open to discussions. He was open to see my view, um, um, uh, to very simple things whenever we meet somewhere to uh, meet a customer or somebody if we agree let's meet at two o'clock he's there at least 15 minutes before if not 20 minutes even today on your show we both arrived late you are uh, at the level of a captain because you were you we know we both arrived early not late sorry, early sorry. <laughs> yes y'all were early <laughs> but you were even earlier there which tells us that you also have this mindset of let's let's prepare let's have a checklist so you see these in emil and i'm happy to uh, uh, to encourage all the listeners, if they're flying a plane, they should know that the pilots are qualified to fly the plane and, the, and they have the maturity and they have the responsibility. It's not two kids. They might seem young, but it's not two kids. Oh, we got a plane now. How about we make a stop in uh, Fort Lauderdale? I'm going to pick up somebody there or let's fly over Atlanta and see Buckhead and go to Chattanooga or whatever. No, no, no. They will follow procedure. You can you can rely on what they're doing. It's not like uh, your nephew uh, just took his driver's license and invites you for a drive. Don't go because you don't know what they'll do, right? But with pilots, and I'm happy to see that uh, to to report that Emil is like that, and be encouraged if you're flying, they're like that too. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really good. I want to I want to circle back to one thing you brought up because I've read a lot of books on leadership for now 30 plus years. And it's kind of becoming more and more rare for me to highlight things, even though I used to be a big highlighter. Now I read with a digital pad here. So I, I, the, the quote that you just gave is one of the items that I highlighted, mm. which I'm going to repeat. Superior pilots use their superior knowledge to avoid a situation where they have to use their superior skills. Yeah. And it's fascinating, and we might even let Emil comment on this, because one of the things that came to mind, and I hope this doesn't show ignorance on anything, but you brought up the Denzel Washington movie, and I don't even remember what the name of the movie was, but the first thing I thought of when I read that quote was him flying it upside down, and he was on cocaine, and all this kind of stuff, and, 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 and I guess one of the things that I realize in our world 
is that a majority of the people, if they do their job well, we don't ever know who they are or anything about them. Uh, Emil, is that kind of correct about a pilot? Is that we really don't wouldn't even know they existed as long as they did their job well. Now we know that there's people that have landed planes on the Hudson River that we hear their name, but they also still have high levels of humility, in my opinion. They don't seem like someone who sought the spotlight. They were just doing their job. Talk a little bit about, I don't know, I don't even know if the level of it's humility, but just the need to go about your business professionally. You brought it up earlier, but not really needing the limelight. We're in a world with social media and podcast. I mean, we're doing it right now, I guess, where people want to be propelled to the limelight. But to me, a pilot, like we talk about, is someone who just operates. And the best, the best job that they can do is for us to not know who they are. Does that make any sense? Respond to that, Emil. Excellent, excellent. Um, for a period of three years, I was the vice president of my company. I was the um, director of the flight operations. So I, I was uh, taking care of my flight ops, uh, 800 people, uh, flight attendants, pilots, different other bureaus and departments. And uh, uh, one time I had, uh, I had an incident and uh, the crew, the, cap the, the command crew, the captain and his co-pilot, they, uh, they saw it right. So they come back, they had an explosion, an engine malfunction, the engine went on fire. So they were immediately returned to, uh, to land. And everybody put pressure on me. And we went on the television, of course, the national carrier, what, uh, what the hero done, the pilot did this, this and this. And uh, I remember my CEO, he, she asked me if I, I will pay them any prize or like, give them a bonus or something like this. And I, I was disappointing everybody because I said, look, this is exactly what we are getting paid for. So when those hundreds or thousands of hours spent in the simulator, the full fly simulator, every six months to train and to be checked, we spend lots of money for that to ensure that the pilots are prepared for exactly these kind of scenarios. So what I did, I did, of course, uh, it was a reception. Everybody applaud them. We shake hands, uh, we said, good, this is uh, what we do, okay? No bonus, no uh, statues, because I think this is normal. This is exactly, yeah, you can fly an entire career of, I don't know, 40 years or so, and you never encounter an engine failure or a major malfunction in an aircraft, and that's good. You just do your job like any other professional. Yeah, close the door of the aircraft and take off with your crew, and if something happens, a uh, sick passenger or something do the best in your ability to save the case to save the day go to, from A to B on time safe and do your job yeah of course the people likes us we are in uniform we go through the terminal and they look at us uh, because we look, mm -hmm. look spectacular some of us in the in uniform yeah but behind <laughs> me before I close the door there's, we have some loading uh, I have colleagues loading masters without them i will not be able to fly they have to check every every load in my uh, cargo compartments in such a way that they ensure that the flight is safe the technicians around the aircraft they prepare my aircraft they are in my they're not flying with me but they are in my team i trust them when i sign yeah when i sign i take the aircraft on me but before that the aircraft was prepared maybe maybe for hours the flight attendants, yeah, they're not flying the aircraft, but they're taking care of passenger lives. And I have a very good chapter in the, in the book explaining how they are so dedicated to their job that sometimes in an emergency evacuation situation, you find themselves, you find them uh, uh, dead on, the, on the near to the emergency exit just before, because they, they want to save more, more passengers. So this is my team. Yeah, I can take the applause uh, when I smooth land or something, or m maybe they be people looking at me uh, with admiration, but I never forget. I always tell to my young colleagues that th this is just the tip of the iceberg. Behind us, there's a huge, huge uh, apparatus. They are working for us. Yeah, I've, I've always said, uh, especially 
in a lot of our domestic flights, I'm sure it's the same international as I've flown international, that that flight attendant, the flight steward, the different t terms for them, that's just one of the toughest one of the toughest jobs out there because number one, you know, the last few years, the people flying have been um, much more on edge. <laughs> I'll, I'll say yeah. it that way. Yeah. And I've seen some people be extremely unkind and uh, not compassionate. And that's been uh, kind of challenging. And, uh, you know, the, you know, you're going about your business, but they're, you know, trying to serve coffee or, something like that and having people arguing about, you know, should they have a mask on and all these other things that are very, very difficult. Octavian, I, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to kind of shift a little bit and move into, all right, you're in the training world, you're consultant, do a lot of the things that I do. And then somewhere along the way, you teamed up with Emil. Sounds like y'all were friends, I think, before uh, this. Somewhere along the way, y'all decided to do something yeah. as cool or crazy, depending on how you want to look at it, as write a book together. <laughs> so yeah. what what was the impetus? What provoked you to write a book? As someone who's just finished writing one, I'm going, there's got to be something behind that. What was the motivation? Yeah, there was a small igniter and then there was a big igniter. The small igniter was that, uh, and this is how I met Emil, by the way, uh, in 2008, I think it was the summer, we were flying with our family on vacation. And um, flight was okay, but what I, what I was surprised by after uh, takeoff was that uh, the captain addressed the, uh, the passengers and uh, we could understand 100% of what he was saying. Uh, and I'm sure you and uh, our listeners have been on flights where the captain is saying something, but we don't exactly know what. It looks like what I always think of, finally, is that they hold their nose and say, this is flight Delta 103 flying from Atlanta to your area. And the temperature outside is very, very, very well. I think, oh, my, what's good? But so in, on that particular flight, we could hear the captain nicely and uh, everything was more. And not only he said the, um, the normal stuff, the temperature outside and thing, but he said, hey, he, on the right hand side, you can see this. On the left hand side, you can see the Danube and then whatever. And this. So oh, that's interesting. So towards the end of the flight, I asked one of the flight attendants, say, sorry, I, I do not remember the name of the captain. Could you say it to me? He said, of course, Captain Emil Dobrovolsky. Okay. Now, one of my colleagues, uh, I knew he had a friend who was a captain at Taron. And I immediately sent an SMS to my colleague saying, hey, tell your friend to give a big bravo to Emil Dobrovolsky when they meet, because the flight was great and the communication was great. And, and my colleague Ciprian replies with a smile and says, hey, my friend is Captain Emil Dobrovolsky. I'll, I'll put you two in touch. So that's how we met. And then we invited Emil to our team uh, once. Um, we had a kind of a summer TTT and had guests and everything. And um, we were fascinated uh, by the stories he shared. Let me just 30 seconds quickly share one, and then if you want to uh, expand on that further, that, that's up to you. Uh, he said, imagine there's an emergency landing uh, at night, and there was a, something going on, and one engine is on fire, and the plane finally stops on the runway, sideways like that, and everybody's scared, and there's this fire and everything. What does the captain do in that particular moment? And he asked us, and uh, all of us went uh, switch off the uh, fire in the or turn on the fire extinguisher. I said no. Um, announce the tower that there's a problem. No. Uh, discuss the evacuation procedures. No. And everybody, everything we said, he kept just saying no, no, no. And they said, okay, what does he do? And he said, nothing. I said, what do you mean nothing? He said, no. the, the 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 design of the operation, the, the operating procedures are built in such a way that when the situation is toughest, the busiest is not the captain. The busiest people are the co-pilot. The co-pilot is extinguishing fire, is communicating with tower, doing a number of things. The flight attendants are very busy, attending to the people, to the elderly lady, to the kids, whatever, preparing them. What does the captain do? And um, there's this expression which we included in the book as it is. They don't make a decision, they build their decision, which is a nice way to phrase it, which means they take into account what's going on there and they, they, they're they not, pushed by some tasks that they have to do. Their co-pilot is trained to do fire extinguishing, communicate, whatever. They can do that. But speaking of um, about maturity, the maturity and the best decision is left on the shoulders of the captain. But his the burden of other smaller tasks is taken away. And we all went, oh, that's interesting. And not only is it interesting, now 
number, number one, it's interesting. Number two is very useful. And number three, this is big contrast to what's going on in many entrepreneurial companies, right? Because there, when there's a crisis, who is the busiest in the room? It's the captain, the entrepreneur, the owner, the whatever. They make the phone calls, they call people, they dis distribute tasks. But in aviation, because they know that's not the best thing to do, if there's delegation and there's everybody else knows what they need to do, so the captain has time to bring. Emil talks about the fact that they sometimes they even pull their chair back a little bit so they have a better overview of the cockpit and uh, make better. So it was a story like that and another one like that. And you know, this is interesting. And then we invited Emil um, to meet our customers and to speak at a few conferences that we do for our customers. And no matter what the audience was, whether it was bankers or pharma people or IT people, the audience every time felt the same two things. Well, this is fascinating and two, this is useful. So after doing that for I don't know, a couple of years and say, Emil, you have to write a book because the aviation is so rich. It's a treasure of know-how that you use it there. Good for you, good for us as passengers. But that could be useful for many of us who uh, lead a team, lead a project, lead a company, or are new, young. They want to uh, make the best decisions for their career. So you should write a book. And he said, hmm, that's interesting. And then a few days later, if not on the spot, he said, let's write it together because you've done this how-to kind of category books before. Uh, so that, that was the beginning of the... Uh, and by the way, uh, speaking of the title, uh, maybe uh, you'll want to discuss with that. We had two titles in mind. We did not start with the title. We said, let's, let's worry about the title later. It will come. Let's list the messages and the stories and the principles. And um, uh, he, of course, shared that. And I built bridges to the audience and everything. And then there was a, there were two titles on the shortlist. One was, this is your captain speaking, to position it as, hey, this is knowledge coming yeah. from the aviation. But we dropped that for two reasons. Number one, we liked the other one better, uh, the dark cockpit. And number two, we did not want to come across as um, uh, superior, arrogant. Now you shut up now, take notes because somebody smarter will tell you what to do because that's not the approach of the book. And if people will get the book, uh, they'll see it's a very uh, adult to adult communication. Here's what happens. Here's why. Here are the benefits. If you want to do that in your life, strong recommendation to do that because you could gain A and B and C and save resources in this way and that way. So that's that's kind of a, in a nutshell, maybe too big of a nutshell, but that's the, that's no, the story. That that's really good. And I, I was actually going to be asking about the title next because titling a book is challenging. I love the yeah. nuance that y'all went through where you basically said you didn't really want to do this is your captain speaking yeah. because it, it is interesting that actually puts across a certain degree of authority and, and it does. You know, maybe dominance yeah. that you might could. Have. However, I think people would have gotten it. Now, I will say this, the title Dark Cockpit was intriguing to me and and i'm going to ask you emil to maybe give a little bit tell us what that actually means here in just a moment but because i read it and i first thought it was a negative because the mm -hmm. word dark sometimes is negative for us of course we know cockpit most people understand what that terminology is so i read it fortunately very early on in the book y'all explain what it what it is but yeah. emil yeah. just br just briefly for the audience tell us the terminology that dark cockpit means because that is the title and uh that's the one that people can recognize when they actually go get the book so dark dark cockpit what, what does that mean dark cockpit is an aviation term i i bet all of all all of all of our listeners or viewers they they saw a cockpit they entered the, the aircraft and they they had a look on the left to see the dark the cockpit lit only by by uh environmental lights to see those buttons, thousands of um, uh, switches or knobs or levers all around the cockpit. Um, dark cockpit means that everything goes smoothly. There's no lights for alerts, for cautions or for warnings. There's a, a color code, meaning that uh, if you see a, there's a dark cockpit and if you see a light, which is white, there will be off in it. So in purpose you put some system off it's like in real life when you have your own cockpit your own control panel and deliberately you put something on off maybe you have a partner which is on off and when you look at your cockpit you see it immediately when you have a light the amber there's a caution light fault there's a system when the uh, 
fault or something, something is broke, you don't have to intervene immediately. You can postpone it. It's like a toothache or something in your life when you postpone things for the next day, for next week. You have a, a deadline which is maybe very late in three months from now and you delay all the all the actions for that deadline, for that the project. Uh, when you have a, a, a blue light which is on, you deliberately put something on, like uh, de-icing is like staying over hours, over over time to do to, to finish the, the job. But of course, if you have lights like this and they're all lit at the same time, it's not dark cockpit, you are wearing yourself down. Your um, your performance is getting low every time you don't have a dark cockpit. So the dark cockpit means that everything goes smoothly. You operate everything normally. You do it properly. You respect every, uh, every action, every SOP. You follow the book doing things properly when you look around you and you, there'll be no light is dark cockpit in opposite an opposite of that you have we call it christmas cockpit and too many times when things goes wrong if you look at the people's control panel or cockpit it's a christmas cockpit because they they used to it they they okay i have some lights don't, don't worry i can postpone it yeah but every time when something goes wrong if somebody will look at what happened they will see that you had the few lights for months now. You didn't address them uh, on a timely manner. So they simply peeled up. And when something like maybe something which is tr trivial or banal will just add to that, they will bury you. And you, you're not able to cope. You're not ab able to perform well. So this is the kind of uh, comparison we do with, between my job and my dark cockpit with your job, with your um, generic cockpit in your in your personal life or in your professional life. Yeah, the, the thing that's challenging about that, maybe Octavian, you could chime in on this with sure. the background you've got. The subtitle of the book is how to communicate, lead, and be in control at all times like an airline captain. And, and here's what I know, because I work with leaders and executive teams and interact with a lot of people is that most people, I don't want to say most people, large numbers of people would not say they are in control at all. And some of them have lights going off. I mean, their, this co their cockpit is not dark. In fact, they might have check engine light on their car. And what they do is they just put a little something over it so that they don't see it. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that being in control versus not in control. And, yeah. you know, one of the things, if I were to say about the demeanor of a pilot, a captain of a plane is they do appear to be peaceful and calm most of the time. I, I'm thinking of one airline here in the United States, Southwest, I'll go ahead and mention them, that they do kind of have a little bit more of a sense of humor maybe than some other airlines. And sometimes that's nice. Sometimes maybe people don't like it as much. But, but most people in their lives, especially over the last few years, have felt out of control. And they might be listening in going, gosh, I can't even begin to grasp what it's like to be in control. What would you say to them, Octavian? Sure. So first of all, so I'm, I'm very glad you mentioned that because what I want to emphasize is if you th read the sub, so because we have a kind of uh, a crazy title, the subtitle needed to be explicit. What it's about? How to communicate? So it's about communication, lead, and being in control at all times, like an airline captain. Now, the first thing I want to mention is that God is in control. So uh, we don't mean to say, uh, but the message there is control what you can. And it's the attitude, it's the spirit, it's the preparedness. Now, if you think directly about a, a, a pilot, they fly from A to B and then there's a storm at B. Can they control the storm? Obviously not, right? Uh, can you say I was in control of the storm? No, but you don't need to be in control of the storm. You need to be in control of what happens to the plane. So if you prepare, if you anticipate, and what, what Emil is doing and uh, the, all the other captains is that when they're flying, they're cruising nicely at uh, 39,000 feet. Maybe they have a coffee or a tea. They don't watch TV. They don't watch Netflix. They don't say, ah, everything's fine. In two hours, we'll start worrying about uh, uh, landing. No. They're always, and the expression is they're always, they, they try to be 10 minutes ahead of the plane, meaning what can go wrong? I see the wind, I see some planes, I see the mountains. What do we do if this happens? 
Do we, what, what airports can we land on? What does it mean uh, for a leader who's not a pilot? It means that, okay, is the pandemic is here. Can you control the pandemic? No, what you can control is, do you get vaccinated? Do you wear a mask? Do you expose yourself? Do you do all the other things? But here's what, what it can mean. So it's about the attitude and preparedness and taking responsibility for what you can do. Let's say, uh, and this happened to many businesses, Pandemic hit, and in 2020, their business was down 40% versus 2019. Okay. It's very easy to say, oh, our business went down 40% because of the pandemic. So there's not much that I could do. It was a pandemic, and okay. Nobody said the pandemic was not there, but maybe someone else in your industry had their business reduced only by 25%. Why? because they did not sit idle for three months saying it's pandemic, but they right away thought, what can I do? What can I do to save costs? What can I do to not lose a customer? What can I sell? What else can I sell that works now? So maybe the business goes down, that's it. There's nothing you can do about it. But how much does it go down? Does it go 40% like the average? Or are you the guys uh, where the business went down only by 25? Or are you the guy that whose business went down uh, 60 or 70 percent. Uh, of course, flying p captains. Uh, what could they do? The flighting was no, nobody. Fly, flighting flights were stopped. But the main message there is: uh, number one, have the attitude that you, even if you cannot control the big things, obviously there will always be things outside of control. Uh, it's the geopolitics, what's going on in the world, the weather, very simple things like I want to go fishing, and it's raining so heavily that. I would be crazy to go in there. But there are always things, no matter what the environment is, there are always things that you can do. And that's the spirit we're looking for. That's the spirit we're looking for. Emil tells a story about that. Sometimes they have some, un, uh, the company has some unannounced um, um, exams. Hey, we need two captains uh, because, because two left. So we're going to have an exam. We're going to have an exam on Friday. So whoever from the co-pilots wants to register, there's going to be a theory test. And then, uh, and some co-pilots say, I, I cannot because uh, I, I didn't know there would be a test on Friday. So I didn't prepare Friday. But what do you mean? Do you not know the rules? Do you not know? You should be prepared all the time for opportunities like that. So it's number one is the spirit. And number two, uh, anticipate and prepare those, those things that you can do. So have a checklist. Um, talk to other people who've uh, been through experiences. Don't rely on learning just by your experience, just by you hitting your, your own head on every uh, door, whatever that is. Talk to others and uh, avoid nine out of 10 mistakes if you can, at least 30 out of 10 if you can. So that's that's what we mean. Yeah, and that, that's good. See, I'm, I'm, my personality leans towards someone who loves to control as much as I can around me. As I've aged, we'll, we'll use the term maturity that you used earlier. As I've matured, I've kind of gotten to the place where I recognize I can't control that much. I can prepare my mindset, my attitude can be ready. And I think y'all conveyed that, uh, that really well in the book. There's another quote that I highlighted that um, in my ebook, it was page 97, but it was the test of a leader is if they leave their team better than they found it. There's a word that I use a lot in all that I do called stewardship. Are you a good steward? Yeah. Do you, if you have control or if you have, uh, you know, leadership over something, it's not really anything you own. And maybe I'll have Emil address this, but you know, he, he doesn't own the plane. He doesn't really own the passengers. He doesn't own the crew. He doesn't, he, he, I guess the patch maybe might be his, uh, that he has here. Talk a little bit about that mindset of someone who is in charge, but you don't really own any of that, Emil. You're just a, a steward of all of that. Talk about that. And then I've got just a couple of questions. We're getting close to starting to wrap up. Um, that kind of thing we, we wrote in the book. They came out uh, talking to each other. I spoke with Octavian and he told me once, he said, you realize that every time you fly, you fly with a different uh, crew. So I said, yeah, of course, we are a big company, so we're not flying too often uh, with the same uh, co-pilot or the same uh, crew members. So he said, yeah, but you have to present in front of them as a lead, a new leader. So that's what we thought. Is yeah, I'm a new, I'm a new leader every day. So this is a challenge to present in front of them every day. I'm waking up tomorrow, let's say at four o'clock, four a.m. 
and uh, it, uh, the airport briefing room at 5 a.m. in front of my crew. And I have to to present myself not as a boss, not as a captain, not as the big uh, uh, guy who's telling them what to do. As I was grown, because when I was a co-pilot, it was a completely different paradigm. It was a completely different environment when uh, the, the boss, the captain was the boss, uh, the father of all of us, uh, he was uh, three meters tall and I was like a, a few centimeters tall and everybody was not so important. But nowadays, you have, if, you, if you do like, like in the old days, you never get feedback. You never get help from them. And of course, they will realize that something is missing in you. As you're, as you, of course, I'm the boss. Of course, I'm taking the decision. I will make the final decision or the final call in emergency or I will take the decision to disembark on unruly passengers, uh, unruly passengers like happened yesterday and things like this. But beside of that, beside of that, if I present in front of them as a leader, they know who I am. They, they, they see my stripes. I don't have to, to impress anybody. So I'll just explain them how things are. We can go do our job with a smile on our face instead of just going like in the army like this. I gave an order to everybody. Uh, it's submission, total submission. I don't need that because in, in case like I, I know it's it's not um, it's, sim it's not as simple as it sounds. But if you do like that, you don't have feedback. You don't have feedback from your uh, people. They will not tell what you don't see. They will not help you making a better decision. Because if I'm I have a feedback from a flight attendant, let's say, or from my colleague, younger colleague, much less experienced than me if he gives me or she gives me the feedback my product my flight is better so it's uh, in, in business i don't know if they accept the feedback of uh, the people inferior in rank but this is my advice to everybody if you are a leader accept feedback in uh, um, encourage real communication not just um, let's communicate uh, you understand yeah everybody know what to do yeah 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 no get the feedback, ask for feedback, um, encourage real communication, talk about uh, things. The real communication in a cockpit is impersonal. We don't talk about uh, how good I am or how uh, unexperienced she is or he is. We are talking about the flight itself. When I do something, when I correct something, or there's a call, a standard call, I don't need an explanation of that. We have to solve it immediately because the, the aircraft flies with uh, 450 miles per hour at any moment. So we have to solve things. We have to think for the future, communicate and accept feedback. Hmm. Octavian, what is one of the goals when someone reads this book and maybe you could even share who you think it might be for so that someone's going, yeah, I, I should probably check this out. Uh, I do think there's value for communications, leadership, all of that, but yeah. I'm going to let, I'm going to let you share that. Um, what would you want the person that gets this book and reads it to take away from it? What would you want them to gain from reading the book? And then we're close to wrapping up here. I've got a, one more wrap-up question. So uh, if you were to um, summarize the audience to just one, it would be leaders. But what we were pleasantly surprised to discover from feedback from readers is that leaders bought it for them to become even better as they lead their team, whether it's a team of three or of 3,000. Then uh, C-suite people bought it for their staff. They bought it for their customers. Dear customer, here's a nice book that you like, uh, it's a Christmas gift or whatever gift, here it is. Uh, they bought it for their kids, uh, for if they're teenagers and above, uh, it's good for them because it kind of guides them. Some young executives bought or young professionals bought it for their parents. Uh, here's a nice book. Here's a nice reading. Uh, an interesting audience that reads the book uh, are the people who are afraid of flying. They're afraid of flying. And we've had feedback from people saying, after having read the book, uh, it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's clear to me that there are a hundred processes in place and nobody just flies uh, because they feel like the, a hundred things that need to be done at the right time that makes me more confident 
uh, when the next time will be that I will have to fly or things like that. So uh, there's a wide audience we, which we, we're, we're happy for. What, can, what do people get out of the book? Well, they get some quick wins, like uh, have a checklist. If you do the more or less same things and you want to avoid things like, oh, I forgot that, or by the way, oh, this meeting, this negotiation, this call, this whatever, again, did not go have a checklist for me, have a checklist. Don't make it too long, but have it written on your phone or somewhere, however three things to do. And then these are quick wins. Uh, and then on the, on the uh, even more important side is the attitude, whatever the environment is, don't aim to control all of it because you can't, but there's always something that you can do. Do the maximum that you can and you'll feel better. You'll feel in control. You'll feel that's one message. Another message is that you can't succeed by yourself. If you, the bigger the goal, the, the more important is that you are part of a team or, or lead a team. Uh, and Captain Emil has mentioned a number of people that maybe want to say, what is the team? Well, it's the co-pilot and the flight attendants. Yeah, but it's the technicians, it's the load manager, it's the tower uh, who help with the communication, it's the um, catering people. We all know if they forget the food or the drinks, some passengers might <laughs> come and make some noise in, in there. So um, uh, a team is essential. Surround yourself with people who have high levels of professionalism is a third message that people can get. And uh, that we, we um, list four criteria. What is, it, what is a good professional? And we'll leave people to discover that. So there's a number of areas that help you become more confident and better at what you are doing, whether or not you lead a team. Yeah, I agree. Like I said, I read through the book in the last few days and I enjoy those four things of uh, being a professional. That was really good. Um, Octavian, real quick, where can people find the book and connect with you sure. guys? And then I've got one question that we'll wrap up with before I, I uh, sure. finish this up. The easiest, if you want to get in touch with us, find us on LinkedIn. Octavian Panti, Emil Dobrovolsky, find us. There's a place you can go, uh, darkcockpitbook.com. It's the website of the book where you can download for free a chapter. It's the chapter that is titled A New Team Every Day, which uh, describes five things that you as a leader can do to quickly um, um, uh, improve the results of the team and make the other ones feel you as a leader, not in the bad way, but in a good way and improve morale and performance of everybody. So it's darkcockpitbook.com. And obviously from there you go, you find links to go and buy the book on Amazon if you want to. Feel free to write us uh, on any subjects. If you have questions, we'll, we'll be glad to answer. Yeah, we'll include all of that down in the notes so people will have links to your LinkedIn and, and everything sure. like that. Um, uh, Emil, we are Seek, Go, Create. That's our title here. And I'm going to ask you one word. Which one resonates with you more than the other two out of Seek, Go, Create, and why? Mm. And then I'm going to have Octavian answer the same question. Emil? From the beginning, I was challenged by this. I knew you would ask me this. So <laughs> I don't know which one is um, I like it more. I think create. I've always been a doer. I've always done things. I can do things with my hands. I did things uh, in my professional career. I did things for my family, with my family. So this is, uh, I think, what characterized me better, create. Very good. I was going to go with, I was going to go with create, but I'll go with go. Uh, ah. uh, meaning, meaning um, their things, try things out, see if it works. Um, you can never tell if an idea is bad or 100% good until you test it a little bit. So the invitation is go try. I like um, uh, the quote of Jeff Bezos a while ago. He said, I don't believe in bet the company bets. So don't take too many risks. But if there's something that um, uh, and you want to take a swing at it and it could I mean to go for it and 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 you'll see uh, how it goes and remember excellent remember what you said Octavia hey, I proposed you to, to take a motorbike and you said no so go <laughs> <laughs> let me let anyway. me go try some other things first but uh, yeah yeah gentlemen yeah. thank I mean, you so much with, uh, yeah yeah to adventurers so I'll yeah. Octavian, I appreciate it. Captain Emil, thank you for keeping people safe as they fly and doing what you do. 
Uh, thank you for joining us here on Seat Go Create. I do encourage you to go check the book out. There's a link down in the, uh, in the notes if uh, you need to go check that out. Thank you for joining us on this episode. It's been a great conversation. I always enjoy speaking with people that have expertise, but then I, I enjoy speaking with people in different parts of the world. I believe that there's just value to that. If you have joined us and you want to connect with us on social media, we are Seek Go Create on all the channels. So you can go share this and comment and, and engage with us. We would love for you to do that. We have new episodes every Monday. Until next time, continue being all that you were created to be.